Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast, where we focus on how authors found success, looking at strategies that have taken them to the top of the bestseller charts, as well as what they've learned from their mistakes. Because being an indie author is more than knowing the latest marketing trend. It's about being innovative and creative and learning from your mistakes. Welcome to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. I'm Sarah Rosette, and my co-host, Jamie Albright, is not able to be here today for this introduction. So this feels very weird to do this by myself. But I'm going to uh, press on and tell you a little bit about the interview that's coming up because we have a great interview today with Nikki Haverstock. Now, she has um, recorded her own fiction audiobooks. And we wanted to talk to her because I feel like recording fiction audiobooks is um, just a whole nother step up from recording nonfiction. Um, I know that there's lots of authors interested in recording their fiction audiobooks. So um, Nikki just gives all of her tips, all of her tools, all the her setup. She talks about um, how she recorded her audio so that there's less editing later. And um, so it's just full of good information about recording your own audiobooks. But then we also talk about the things we know, we talk about in every interview, like, you know, what she wishes she had known about writing and craft and um, some mindset things. So it's a really good all around interview. So it's really interesting to talk to her because she did her audiobook. She did her fiction audiobooks and she also edited them herself. Now I did my nonfiction book and I did that because um, I knew that I wanted that a lot of people like to hear the author reading nonfiction. So I did my um, narration for that and then um, I outsourced the uh, post-production, the editing and post-production. Now, she edit, Nikki did her own. So this will give you like two kind of points of view on ways to do your own audiobooks. Um, I'm pretty sure, well, I'm actually completely sure that I will not be narrating my fiction at this point. Um, I am using a professional narrator for that who does a great job, and I really like the way she's doing the audiobooks. So I won't be doing my fiction audiobooks, but I know that there's a lot of interest in this. And so um, I thought I would give you a quick overview in the intro here of, of my setup for my fiction narration or for my nonfiction narration. And then you can compare what I've done with what Nikki talks about. And then with all the links in the show notes, you'll have tons of resources and a good starting point for figuring out how to record your own audiobooks if you're interested in doing that. So I'm going to go through a couple of quick questions that I've received from quite a few people and answer these to give you an overview of what I've done. And then you can compare that with what Nikki did and find out, you know, pick what works best for you. So um, one of the questions I've got is um, what resources helped you the most? And for me, I used, um, the course audiobooks made or yeah the course audiobooks made easy from Derek Depker and that link will be in the show notes that's an affiliate link and it was just really a helpful course it was not time consuming it was exactly what i needed to help me get started with the microphone and the setup and it told me how to edit i just i did like the very smallest amount of editing i could editing i could do to remove mistakes so there would be less for the person that I outsourced it to, to work on. But um, if you want to do that yourself, this um, course covers it all. So that was a great starting point for me. Another question I've been getting is, do you have recommendations for gear? And um, what I used was the ATR 2100 microphone. Nikki talks about the microphone. She used a different one. Um, right now, the one that I have, the ATR 2100 has been discontinued, but there is a current version called the, the full name is the Audio Technica ATR 2100X. So they added that X to make it extra special, I guess. But um, if you want to look at that, that's available. You can probably find it, you know, online pretty easily. A link to that will be in the show notes. Another question I've gotten is, did you use an isolation shield was a regular room to echoey, you know, what was basically, what was your setup? So what I did was I used Derek's recommendation of a patio umbrella. And he talks about this in his interview on the Creative Pen podcast. So go look for that interview. The, I'll link to it in the show notes because he talks about how the patio umbrella is a great setup. And I agree. It's big enough that it covered my whole desk and I draped 
blankets from the side so that it created, you know, almost this like padded sound booth effect without me having to actually set up a sound booth. And um, it was just easier for me to do that. Nikki records a completely different way and I'll let her tell you about her setup and how it works for her. Um, But that worked really well for me and it was a great temporary solution because I'm not going to be doing this um, audiobook recording day in and day out. So that worked really good for me. And then the last question I've gotten is about editing and mastering the video or the audio after you get done. So I outsourced this because I felt that since I'm not planning to do lots more um, audiobooks, I didn't feel like that was a skill that I needed to take the time to learn, that my time was better spent probably working on other books and other parts of my business. So um, the I did learn how to remove the majority of the mistakes, but there's still a lot of editing that needed to be done. So I outsourced that to someone named Reed Lossberg, and he is interested in working with more authors. He's kind of new to editing for audiobooks. He's been doing audio for podcasts and things like that. But um, he is interested in working with more authors, and he w- he said it's fine if people contact him through his um, email. So that his email will also be in the show notes. So if you're interested in having someone handle the mastering of the removing the mistakes and then the mastering of the audio, you know, getting the sound just perfect, um, he does that. Now Nikki does that herself, and you know she talks about how she uh, gets her set up um, as her setup as clean as possible so that her audio is as clean as possible. Um, So yeah, there's lots of good information in here and lots of tips. And we even talk about promotion and things like that. So um, I think if you're interested in audiobooks or even thinking you might be doing it someday, this could be a good interview to help you get started. So we will go to the interview now. So here's Nikki Haverstock. So Today, we're really excited to have Nikki Haverstock with us. Hi, Nikki. Hi. We're so glad you're here. We have lots oh, of questions you. about audio and all yes. kinds of things. Yeah. So um, let me read your bio and we'll get started. Nikki Haverstock is a writer who lives on a small ranch high in the Rocky Mountains. She studied comedy writing at Second City and has published 13 cozy mysteries that are heavy on the humor. Before fleeing the city, she hosted a competitive archery reality show, traveled the world to study volcanoes, taught archery and computer science at a university, and worked on her family's ranch herding cattle. Nikki has more college degrees than she has since, and hopefully one day she will put one to work. Nikki likes to write comedy pieces that focus on the everyday humor of family, friends, and everyday life. She tried stand-up, but the cattle weren't impressed. (laughs) That's so great. I um I took an archery class in college and someone about 12 miles away from where we were actually shooting got hit in the butt with an arrow because I completely missed the target, but I had a lot of velocity on oh, it. Oh no. Yeah, no, it wasn't good. Oh no. Uh, <laughs> it just like we never found the arrow. It just went it, it was terrible. <laughs> so, uh let me get to the first question here. Um, so tell us how you get into writing. Um, well, I think like most writers, I was a huge reader my whole life. You know, that was my number one hobby. And um, I always had this assumption that I couldn't write, that that writing, um, I don't know where I got this idea, but I guess I figured that, you know, a lady in a lake somewhere gave you a golden quill and then you became a writer. <laughs> so I always just had this assumption that because writing was hard for me, that meant I couldn't be a writer. Um, and then I was really involved in glass arts and Deanna Chase, who um, some people might be familiar with, um, I knew reasonably well through that. And she had published this book and um, we all knew that she was incredibly successful. And my fam- my husband and I took a vacation, swung by where she was and we visited for a couple of days. And when I was there, she just kind of explained like, hey, if you just really want to work really hard, you can become an author. Like you don't need to have other than hard work and the desire to do it, you don't really need a special skill. Um, And I had just kind of gone through a career change and um, I had had a miscarriage. And I was at this point where I thought, I, if I 
can't be a mom, what do I want to do for the rest of my life? What am I really passionate about? And so I decided that um, I was willing and my husband encouraged me just to throw myself into this. And by the time I realized how hard it was, I was already far enough al- along to where I had done a lot of the really hard work, but I yeah. knew it would be hard, but it's, hard, it's, it's still harder than you think it'll be. Oh, way harder. Yeah. 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 That's so great. That's really a little bit of the, my story too. I mean, you know, I just, I never thought I could be a writer. So yeah, that's, uh, mm-hmm. I, but it is a lot, a lot of hard work, harder work for me sometimes I think. And um, so when, Wait. and when was that? What year was that? Uh, that was, I published in 2015 and I started, so 2014 oh, around wow. March is when, because I really went from like, I hadn't any thoughts about writing. I probably, it was probably in the back of your mind. You know, you always think, oh, if I ever wrote a book, I'd do this. But right. then I went on this trip and came home being like, I'm going to write a book. It was, it was mm-hmm. for me, it was that, that's very much, I just jumped in. I joined Romance Divas, which was at the time a very active forum, and then just systematically just started learning everything I needed to know um, and just jumped in and wrote a, a hot mess of a book, but learned a lot and then started yeah. with my real book. Yeah. <laughs> That's very good. often often the way it goes. You mm-hmm. have the, yeah. the practice book or books. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think we've all got those stuck around somewhere. So what was your first big success? Um... Well, I'd like to think that my first big success is ahead of me, but my first, you know, as we all had, but, you know, and and there's been lots of step ups along the way. Um, I think just being able to break even on my first book was a huge, a huge thing. Um, Getting it out there, finishing it. I wasn't, I did the whole thing kind of being like, can I really finish a book? And so that was huge. And then um, my first paranormal cozy was the, was the one where it just, kind of sold and I went well, why is it selling so much like what's mm-hmm. going on and that was the first one that was after I was able to have a child and I had my son and I was so freaked out because I just gotten I felt like I was starting out um and I published in August and then in March we found out I was pregnant and so I had didn't even have a whole year of publishing underneath my belt when I had my son and so I'm like I'm just gonna I don't want to screw anything up. I'm just going to write a book from my heart with all these post baby hormones. And that was the book that um, su- surprised me in the sense that it sold more than, um, than I was expecting. Mm-hmm. That's great. That's, That's awesome. That's and sometimes so I think when you take off some of the restraints and just kind of let mm-hmm. yourself go, that's when you do some of your best work and you probably weren't specifically trying to hit certain genre tropes or you were just writing what you were interested in and what you loved, right? Yeah. I mean, I did, I spent a lot of time, um, figuring out the balance between like, if it's, if for those who aren't familiar, paranormal cozies are sort of like if you took urban fantasy and murder, she wrote and found the mid ground. So figuring out how do I make this still a mystery and how does the magic feel fun? But the magic can't be, a, uh, I feel the magic can't be the perfect solution. You can't just have the whole thing and at the end cast a spell and find the, find the um, killer murderer. unless yeah. yeah the murder. Yeah. Unless there's something, th- there's been some sort of clues along the way that feel like a cozy mystery. So I did spend a lot of time on that, but um, so I won't say it was easy and it was like, Oh, I just wrote from my heart and it flowed out of me. And it was so, n- that is not the kind of writer I am. It's always, uh, it's always um, a lot of work, but it was, um, it was definitely something I was doing because I thought I just need to write. Mm-hmm. And so it was, it was definitely a little different than my other books for sure. That's right. That's right. So what do you wish you'd known about writing and craft before you started? Um, uh, Oh, well, I don't wish I had known that how hard it would be because I think it would have scared me. Um, <laughs> I knew it'd be hard and it's still harder. I, I think, oh, I know, I know a really clear answer to that, which is I wish I had known that it's okay that it's this hard. Um, you, there are definitely writers out there and I respect them who say that writing is a joy to them, that every time I sit down at the page is pure ecstasy, that there's nothing on earth they would rather do. I'd rather eat bonbons and watch trashy TV. 
Um, yeah. It's incredibly fulfilling to write. And I will say that when you get on a roll and the words are flowing, it is, I mean, I don't want to sound ecstasy. I mean, it really is like <laughs> writing, a, you know, like surfing and you catch that perfect wave and everything's balanced. It is amazing, but that's 1% of my writing. And the fact that the other 99% is hard doesn't mean I'm doing it wrong. Doesn't mean that I'm not a real writer. Doesn't mean that um, I should be writing something different. It's, ju- it's just for me, that's it's work and it, that's okay. And I wish I had known I had known that in my heart. I'm sure people told me, but I didn't, I, I, I still, to this day, this morning, I did my morning pages from the artist, the artist way. Yeah, the artist. And, and, and I was like, why is this so hard? And then I'm like, well, it's supposed to be hard. It's a job, you know? And, and so it's something I'm definitely, and every once in a while you meet someone and they're like, I've never had writer's block and yes. it's always a joy. And I'm, I'm glad that that's their experience, but it's okay that mine's different. Right, right. I think you're my spirit animal. Yeah. I mean, th- it's the same exact way for me. And in fact, I'm, I just read a book on comedy. And so one of his suggestions was morning pages, but you're supposed to go back and look at your morning pages and maybe you can find some nuggets of funny, you know, something you can build on or whatever. And I'm like writing my morning pages thinking there is nothing funny about this. That I mean, like, it's basically like, why am I having to do this? I can't, you know I mean? This is so hard. And so, yeah, I get it completely. Yeah. Just even like something that's supposed to be unstructured and just pouring, you know, what's in your head out is hard. It's just, it's hard. I don't know why that is, but yeah. yeah. But it is okay. I've, I've had to remind myself that too. My kids used to say that um, they would be, like if they weren't good at math or they had to work hard at math that they weren't good at math. And I would say, that's not true. You just have to work hard at, and I've had to remind myself of those words more than once. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's a great answer. Yeah. I don't know that the, yeah, I think I, I love that state of having written mm-hmm. that saying about like, I, mm-hmm. I love having written because you've done it, you've accomplished it, but in the actual writing process, it is very hard for me too. And, but then I too, I also think that if it was easy, then everyone would do it, you know, it, and there's something to be said for when you, if a book has been really hard to write and you get through it, then you have that sense of accomplishment of, Mm -hmm. okay, Mm -hmm. I did it. I made it through that. I worked out that plot twist. (laughs) You guys, it must be harder, like writing a mystery, like just, you know, making, like you said, Nikki, not just at the end, having somebody cast a spell and, oh, poof, or we've talked about this, like, you find the letter and everything's answered, you know, I mean, you have to build in those clues or it's not a satisfying mystery. And so, yeah. um, you know, so I think that's awesome. Yeah. Great answer. Well, what do you wish you'd known about marketing? Mm. Um, I think the biggest thing about marketing is I thought marketing was being good at saying, buy my stuff. And what I've discovered about marketing is that, it's you have a product people want. People want books. People want mysteries. Um, there's a million groups out there, and so all marketing is is taking your product and showing it to the right people, and they're happy to buy it. That that's all it is. It's not it's not figuring out how to sell um, ice in the Arctic. It's not trying to sell sand in the at the beach. I mean, it, it can feel like that, and I totally understand. I make it sound like it's so easy, but it's not. I don't have to walk around saying, I'm so great. I'm so wonderful. Buy my stuff. Cause I don't think maybe there are people who feel comfortable with that, but once again, it's the same thing, which is most people don't, they don't feel comfortable. And so I'm not doing that. Um, I've, uh, I, my most successful thing is giving away something for free. And just the fact is if people read it and they like it, they're happy to buy the rest of it. Um, and so sometimes people say, well, you know, oh, I'm not going to devalue my work by making it for free. I feel that because I value my work so much, I do free because all I'm saying is here. I think that if you like it, um, you'll you'll want to buy more and I think it's worth looking at. And so that's been my my main way of doing it. And the marketing has not been as gross or painful as I thought it would be heading in. And it's more of like, hey, 
you want a potato, I sell potatoes. See if you like this potato. And if you like it, you can buy more. Except they're books about funny, independent women who have a close group of friends who are making a, a difference in their world by solving murders. And so a lot of people want that. Great so answer. True. So yeah, true. That's a great and that's, answer. Yeah. And I think we get so focused on the mechanics sometimes of like, you know, how do you know, how do I set up this ad? If, is this image going to work? Or, you know, and if we think about the bigger picture, sometimes that makes it easier. If we think about, I just need to find the people who like this type of book, yeah. then, you know, then half your work is done. Which yes. Is awesome. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. So what assumptions did you make at the beginning of your writing career and looking back, did they turn out to be right or wrong? Um. I think for anyone who started around me, and I just was kind of deconstructing this with a, a friend who's a writing coach, is that um, three or five books you'd be making a living. You'd be, you would have have made it, especially in two thousand. I started a month after K one stopped, um, K U one, which is mm-hmm. when you got a flat fee. So anybody who read twenty percent of twenty, thirty, whatever percent of your yeah. book, you got a full. Um, payment and it was like two dollars or something. So everyone was writing these 10k serials, and you could, you know, I knew someone who started less than a year ahead of me who had made twenty thousand the month that I, um, that I released. And so, you know, everybody said, "Oh, it's not that easy." But every everywhere you turned, everyone was making so much money. Um, and so there was this assumption that if you were good you would be making a living by, first it was like three to five books. Then it was, you know, like eight books. Well, then it was once you had at least five in a series. And um, that, that, that to this day is still underlying a lot of my assumptions that if you were good, you would already be making a living. And so if you're not making a living, you must not be good. And that is so not true. Um, My, my, what I wish I had known more and I talked to more people were that a lot of these people who are making bank on self-publishing had been traditionally published. So they were not year one. It might be their first self-publishing, but they were not year one. They had um, a lot of people had worked for 10 years writing books to try to get an agent. They're not at year one. They have a tremendous back, you know, background. And so here I come in, I don't even know how to, my very first book, I didn't even know how to like do a new line after each line of dialogue, after each, you know, <laughs> yeah. so that you would go, Mary talks, new line, Beth talks. I just had these big paragraphs yeah. of, you know, I mean, that's how little I knew and how much I had to learn. And so I was starting at just absolute ground zero. And I was comparing myself to people who had been in RWA looking for agents for 10 years, maybe had agents, maybe had traditional deals. Um, and um, I think that still exists uh, in certain Facebook groups, certain attitudes. I think it's incredibly helpful if your BFF is a successful self-published author mm-hmm. um, and can help you. But it's also can really it can really get in your head that um, that idea that if I had if I was good, I would be making more money and make those two equal. Yeah, this just came up on another podcast. I think it was when we were talking with Zara Keen because she said when she started, the philosophy was you need three books. And if you have three books, then you'll be fine. And then it changed to, well, now you need five books. Yeah. And it's like we like these paradigms where I just need to do X to get Y result. And right. a lot of times it, it doesn't apply yeah. either in your genre or, you know, for the new, like there's phases at the, the industry goes through and mm-hmm. as things change, you know, things yeah, or change. maybe it may work for X number of di- months and then things change. Yeah. It's yeah. just, uh, yeah, that's, that's very true. Very true. Have you ever made a mistake that turned out to be a good thing? Um, well, I, I mean, switching even subgenres was, I'm sure people would have told me it was a mistake, you know, jumping from cozy to paranormal cozy. And obviously it, um, it, it was a big breakthrough for me. I made more on, I, that's still my best selling series um, to this, you know, to, to now. And hopefully I, that won't always be the case and the next one will be better, but that was definitely something that seemed like a mistake, but I was so scared of, um, messing up my initial series with baby brain Mm -hmm. that I, I, I didn't want to touch it. And, um, let me think if there's other things. 
That's the big one. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of, I, I struggle with wanting to do everything right mm-hmm. by industry standards. And so I, I tend not to be super crazy with taking big risks. And that's, um, that's something I'm actually trying to uh, get away from. Like I, I did a space cozy and it has not sold particularly well, but I think it really grew me as an author. Right. Um, and I got really great reviews um, on theme and character arc, which I've never, no one has ever mentioned those in any of my reviews. So I'm going to stand by that, <laughs> even though it still has not earned out, mm-hmm. um, that that was, that sometimes it is right to make bad business decisions for personal growth. And I think that's something that people might be willing to, to on the surface say, yeah, no, I agree. But then they will, they will turn around and be like, but you got to drop this. This is not working. This is not a genre. And yeah. so I think we're still as an industry, when we give feedback a little, a little tough on things like I had to write this book to get it out of my head, or I had to, I had to, um, that, that particular book was about who are you after failure, which is a personal, just, I could talk about it for years. And so getting it out into the world was really important to me. Mm-hmm. Very good. Very good. Uh, and so the opposite is a question we like to ask. Have you ever done anything you thought this would be awesome? This is going to be the home run. And then it turned out not to work. Yeah, absolutely. I, um, there's this, I won't say his name. I was, I almost did, but it doesn't really matter. And, uh, but it, he's a famous humorist, mm-hmm. um, has written a number of books that I adore. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, um, so I also do a little bit of like online satire for just to kind of stretch myself. I've taken a bunch of second, those are my second city classes that I took Mm -hmm. that I started with where it's called online satire. It's basically like the onion. Um, Mm -hmm. but they tend to, you know, uh, but I just do it for fun. I'm not with the onion, but it's that same type. And through that sort of network of people that I knew from that, they had a fundraiser where they said, Hey, for $800, he will review a manuscript up to, you know, 80,000 words, and he will give you a humor review, um, critique edit. He will go through, and I thought, oh my gosh, this is the most amazing thing. I, I have to do this. This is, um, I respect him so much as a writer. I desperately, desperately want to be funny more than anything in the world. Um, I want to be, you know, I want people to describe my books as I was really on the ground. It was so much fun. It was such an adventure. So I did this, and he took about a month and, and he actually reviewed the same paranormal cozy that I was talking about. Um, and he sent me back and it was a copy edit. It was just a copy edit. And it was like, um, and there was not a single mention of humor jokes, nothing in the whole thing. And he wrote me this page long note about how, um, he found it very confusing. He didn't understand why the cat was in the book so much, which I feel like if you're a cozy reader, you know, that that's like a, that's it's like, like a, a basic uh, thing. Yeah. It's, 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 I, I don't even know where to say. It's like saying, I don't understand where there's a murder in this book. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, These are yeah, a thing. Yeah. This is a trope in cozy mysteries. You don't have there to have an animal, that. but yeah. if you, if you have an animal, the animal's going to be in the book a lot. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. And he didn't really understand, you know, a lot of stuff he didn't understand. And he said to put the book in a, in a drawer and put it away for maybe two, three years and then look at again. And I'm like, I'm in the middle of a self-publishing career. I can't, <clears throat> excuse me, I can't put a book away for two to three years. And I was just devastated. And nowhere in there did he talk anything about humor. He didn't say anything about, and I looked at the whole thing and I was just devastated. I had spent $800, which is more than I spend on my normal edits altogether. I was going to publish this book um, in like a week. And I wrote my development editor. I sent her the whole thing and was like, I don't even know what to do with this. And she's like, delete it. I was supposed to have a follow-up hour-long call with him. That's what I had really paid for. And he was going to give me all this advice. And she's like, don't take the call. It's going to undermine you. It's yeah. going to it's going to hurt your confidence. Yeah. I thought it was such a brilliant idea. And then I realized it's just not, he doesn't understand self-publishing. He doesn't understand women's, um, a, a genre that is dominated mostly by female writers and women. He's probably never read a cozy mystery. He doesn't understand what he's doing. Why am I yeah. taking advice from someone who... Um, you know, so I thought it was such a great idea. I was so excited 
and I, it was such a bad, it turned out to be such a bad experience, but I'm, I'm yes. really thankful to my editor for telling me yes. not to take this call. Don't let him get in your head. Right. She, she knows I'm a big thinker. I want to do the right thing. And this would have really, really would have set you, you know, back. Yeah. Yeah, set me back think, huge. Yeah. I think that's a good example of how difficult it is to find someone to critique your work that you have, you need somebody who's familiar with your genre, because if you have mm-hmm. somebody who's never read a cozy reading your cozy mystery, they're not going to understand those critical elements that readers want. And yeah, it's really, it's really hard to get um, the right type of feedback. And yeah, but you obviously learned a lot from that, even though it was, you know, a difficult thing. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Well, so we also wanted to talk to you about um, your narrating your uh, fiction audiobooks. And I know that there's a mm-hmm. lot of interest in this. So um, can you tell us uh, what made you decide to narrate your books yourself? Um, well, in my bio, you had seen that I did um, a reality show. And so I was hooked. And so I had done a little bit of, we call them pickups, where you go back in and don't have the exact right words. And so we, some of that, and I remember being in the studio and just loved it. And I've always thought it'd be so cool to be a voiceover artist and all of that. Um, and I took through second city, uh, which if people who don't know, second city is like where, um, Eugene Levy, Catherine O'Hara, Tina Fey, Amy Poehler, Chevy, basically everyone who's been on Saturday Night Live, everybody who did, um, just all these amazing things comes through. They do improv, they do sketch writing, they do all these different things. And so you can take online classes. I took the satire series and I ended up taking a podcasting class of radio TV podcasting class. And part of it, we were, I was planning to do a podcast and then at the time I ended up not doing it, eventually did it. But I had all this information on like how to do editing. I'd learned it in the class, did all this stuff. And I'd always thought I would love to be a voiceover person and do my own book, but I never really made that jump because I thought mm-hmm. it would be unprofessional um, mm-hmm. that I'd be looked looked down on. And, you know, even within the self-publishing community who at when it started was looked down on by, by some traditional authors, not all by any means and some traditional companies, um, publishing companies, I still kind of felt like, Oh, this would be too big of a thing until a friend came and said, haven't you ever thought about doing it? And I was like, yes, 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 yes. I've totally thought about it. Thought about it a million times. Do you think it'd be a good idea? And was like, off. Um, and once, and there was just no way I can afford to, to pay for audio. Um, and then I, I, I wanted to do it. Like I knew how my character sounded in my head. I knew how Mm -hmm. she would say this joke and how she would walk that line between it sounding a little sarcastic, but not mean and all of that stuff. And so I really wanted to do it. Um, and I really wanted to perform, um, I've been dying to be a performer of some kind for quite a while. I think that's not terribly uncommon in writing. I know some people have no desire to be on a stage, but I know quite a few who were actors and performers and radio people and all that kind of stuff. So I don't think it's completely unheard of. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then I just dove in and did all the research and figured out how to do it. And I, I really enjoyed it. And I've gotten faster and better um, with time. Mm-hmm. I think for comedy, uh, people that write comedy, because, you know, I write romantic comedy. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is like, I've thought about it too. Because, yeah. especially for the jokes, like in my fourth book, it begins the first line is Brad walks into a bar. Like, that's the joke. Right. And my narrator, I even said it like the way I wanted it to sound. She never did get it because she, she didn't get the joke, I guess, or she just didn't hear it in her head the way I heard it. And, um, but it's so much work. I mean, um, what is your process? I mean, do you have any tips for people getting started and stuff like that? I have so many tips. And since (laughs) Sarah asked me if I wanted to do the podcast, I've been thinking nonstop. So I, I boiled it down to right off the bat, two things. So if you're listening and you're hearing and you're going, okay, I wonder if I could do it. There's two things I think you have to do. One, you have to be okay with hearing your voice. Mm -hmm. Um, That's the number one thing that people Mm -hmm. say, oh, I could never narrate because I have to listen to my voice. And they're correct. Um, I'm not crazy about listening to my voice, but when, when I was doing that reality show, I, the, 
the director showed me some footage and I went, oh, you know, I hate watching myself. And he's like, well, if you want to do this job, you're going to have to get over it. Mm -hmm. And I never said another word because I (laughs) wanted that job. Um, And you just get over it. It's the same way. um, We're we're all writers. And so remember when you used to write, you didn't want to show anyone and you got over it. You just got to get over it. You just got to be like, this is part of the job. This is just, this is no different than my, my writing and just be okay with it. So if you right now think, I just, I don't want to ever get over it, then it's probably, you're probably dooming yourself a little bit. So you have to be okay with that. And then the second is you've got to be reasonably good with hunting out your own information. So this morning I went and I tried to find the web pages that I use to do, to determine how I would do my audio editing and mm-hmm. I couldn't find them. Um, and I hate not being able to say, here's a tutorial, but I just did a lot of ACX, which is, you know, audible, the audible thing. They have the most res- restrictive rules. So if you pass them, you'll pass everybody else, meaning that they'll, they'll accept it. So they're kind of the, the highest bar to cross and you've just got to figure it out. Um, and so there is a Facebook group, authors who narrate their own audiobooks. I believe is the full title. <laughs> I joined recently. Um, they have a ton of free education. It's not how I do my audiobooks, mm-hmm. um, but it's at least somewhere I can send people so that they can they can try to get more. Um, I use. Should I just dive in? And kind yes. of tell us all you? your tips. We're we're, okay. we're curious about like your setup, and yes, you know, like how you actually prepare to do your your recordings. Like, do you? have a script and mark it up, stuff like that. I should. I'll get to that in a second. But <laughs> I, I, sh- I, I should because I actually did follow up. Both Second City and Groundlings have online classes. And I took a one-day voiceover class from Groundlings. It was like $45 and it was two hours. Mm-hmm. Um, and he t- did talk about that a great deal, about like having it and putting in spaces and all that. Um, and Second City, I actually might take it to go to the next level. Um, but I love classes. Like I love and I love to be created and I love to have people push me. So that is definitely my thing. You don't have to do that. Um, and there are like four or $5,000 classes and I'm not doing those. I'm not, I'm not doing those things. I'll do it myself. Um, but so I, we're actually filming the ladies here can see I'm in my closet because this is where I film. So I had heard early on, I have all this stuff. I don't know where I learned it from, but I, I had heard closets are great place to record because all of the clothing acts like natural soundproofing. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy. It's a kind of a weird shaped closet because I have, there's, there's um, shelves back behind it. Oh, you might've even heard me tap that. Mm -hmm. Um, And I just have a standard blue Yeti. It's $150 with an arm. I have my husband's guitar music thing that I put my iPad on. And then I have a little table. It's actually a hospital table. Mm -hmm. Um, On the side, you can grab it and lower it because the sound of the fan can be picked up. So when I'm recording, I'll lower it really low. And then when I'm doing stuff like this, I can raise it and do stuff on it. Um, And then I just stand in a a closet. I only record when my entire family's out of the house because it's, as Jamie noticed, it's like everything catches and stuff. So um, because that is rare, especially now with everybody being home for the pandemic, I, I usually record, I can do about an hour at a time before I start to get tired and the problem, it's a performance. So every time you go, I have to go edit that out. Every time I stutter, I have to edit it out. I use a system where I just, I have the book. I should do a pre-read. That is what is highly recommended. I don't. Um, I actually, when I first started, I would record each chapter twice. And I found that the first recording had the most energy. It also has more mistakes, but it has more of my initial, and I do like being able to read it with fresh eyes because guess what? I go through and I edit it. I go, this doesn't make any sense. I wrote the book. I don't know. So I will say that doing audiobooks, your own audiobooks makes you a better writer because you go, we need to put a lot more tags in here. I have no clue who's talking and I wrote the book. (laughs) Um, You know, I like to write half a sentence in certain action, the other half of the sentence I'm getting away from that because in it's not as clear in the audio book. So it does make you a little better writer. I will go through and clean up little things here and there. Um, But um, I use a system where if I make a mistake, I clap Mm -hmm. just really loud in front of the camera. And then I go back 
at the beginning of the sentence and start again. Um, that's, I don't know where I got it. I think I was taught that um, in my, my, um, my class that I took, but uh, some people, there's a different things. There's something called punch and roll where you, you move the track back and you record over and it's supposed to be uh, faster editing. But see, for me, recording time is my pristine time because I can't have the heater on. I can't have the swamp cooler on mm-hmm. the, the, no one can go to the bathroom because right below us is the bathroom or they turn on the fan. I get this buzz noise. Um, the walking around will even do it. So my goal is to always have the cleaner, the audio you start with the better, um, the less you have to do to it and the better it sounds, which is pretty obvious. So I prioritize having the cleanest, most, as perfect as I can get at audio. Um, that means the dogs can't even be barking outside. My husband can't go by in the four wheeler. So really it's like I send my mother-in-law who lives with us, my husband, the baby all out and I get about an hour. Um, mm-hmm. And so I will do about an hour at a time. Mm-hmm. So do you, so you, you do like an hour at a time and then do you record the whole thing and then edit it all at once or do you edit as you go? I would recommend, especially in the beginning, editing as you go, because I, I have had, um, I, I used to be able, something happened. I used to be able to use one setup and then all of a sudden, and I, I like, I increase the view of it. So now when I look at the audio, I can tell you if it's good enough because I always have it, this zoomed, I always zoom in twice. I always, um, zoom in lengthwise and amplitude wise, a certain way I have it set up a certain way on my screen so that when I look at it after a while, you start to see it and know what it sounds like. And I, I used to be able to have my microphone anchored to the table that my computer was on. Mm -hmm. And at some point, I guess the fan got unbalanced. Mm -hmm. And so it lightly shook the mic, which created, they call it the floor noise, which is like when no one's talking, that's the floor noise. Um, And increased that to a degree that it would not pass ACX. So, um, I do recommend doing that, but there are times that I, I vary it. Um, I can, I am not someone who can multitask very well. I'm very, I have a high focus for the strength finder people. Um, I have a high focus. So I find it difficult to record one audio book, edit, and then go to a different book and sink into that book. So I tend to bunch stuff up, try to do all my recording in a week. Um, and then it's, it, it tends to be a between book project for me. That's just, I, I, I would suggest finding a better way, but you know, if you're like me and you can only do one thing at a time, then lean into it and just edit for a week. Um, I started with my worst, my least selling series because it's a novella series. I'm a big fan of starting and finishing a project and then the next project it, doing it better and then better. And so they're three hour books. It's, it's nice and easy. Um, every book got better. Every book kind of stepped up. And so I, it, I haven't seen, a, I, I'm making a profit because my costs are so low, but um, it's not, it, it's not making a ton, but that series is not making a ton either, but I've learned so much. So I suggest um, my recommendations is when you start, just record a couple of minutes, go through the whole process like you're going to upload it. Make sure I use a program called Audacity. It's available on Mac and PC. It is what a lot of professional narrators use. Um, and you can download something called ACX Check, which is will then be right in the program. Highlight you that tell you exactly if it passes. You can get something that's called Set RMS, which is one of the things that if you go to ACX requirements and Google it, you'll get a sheet that says, here's everything you need to know about how to make a book pass. Um, this is what you need to have at the, you need to have this much at the beginning of the chapter, this much at the end of the chapter. You need to have this much, you need to have this in the title, all that. Um, I have all those notes. I, I feel so overwhelmed because I'm like, I, I want to tell them everything to do. I want to walk them through it. But this is where I say that you've got to have you've got to be comfortable kind of searching out this stuff. You have to be comfortable yeah. finding Google. Um, I had to figure it out myself. Mostly I did join a professional narrators Facebook group. Um, but it also that when I was like, I'm an author trying to do my own books, they were a little bit like, well, 
you know, you really shouldn't do that unless you, you know, you have a performance back. And that will certainly help. But I think if you also are really passionate about performance, you can, I mean, at some point, every actor wasn't an actor. And so if you take it really seriously, um, well, then. I would, I yeah. wanted to ask too, like if someone is brand new at this and say they have a book that's like 50 to 70,000 words, what would be a realistic amount of time to plan to set aside if you were just going to work on that? Like, because there's a lot of learning in the beginning and I know people will get faster, but would you recommend like a month? Yes. Or, yeah. Yeah, that would probably, that would probably be enough. I found narrating exhausting because you're performing. You're not just like talking to your husband, like, Hey, broccoli, you're like uniquely powerful, a distinctive, you know, like it's this, this level of, I think a lot of, um, and when I say performing, I think a lot of teachers are also in a great place with a background mm-hmm. um, where you have this energy because you're kind of like sharing your energy with the audience. So that's why I said I only do – when I started, it would be about a half hour. I recommend doing a whole a whole chapter. Mm-hmm. Um you you want to make sure that you have like a standardized – the standardized distances, like you kind of make like a hang 10 figure – to you to the microphone. That's kind of a standard amount. I, this closet, these clothes are never moving from me to the end book. I set everything up. No one comes in here. No one touches it. The the chair doesn't move. I try to do all that really. Um, I do it on my iPad, when up the Kindle app and I do, I, you know, I do it that way so that I don't have pages rustling. Um, th- th- when you start, it's going to be really hard and you're going to be um, I might, I, while I don't do a whole read through, you might find it nearing the first page and then going back and starting again might help. Cause I always start off a little stiff at the beginning chapter one, she walked into the room and then later I'm like, she walked into the room and it just, people can hear that. And especially at the end of one chapter into the next. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, it's very normal that your first hour might take you eight hours to edit. Um, for me, I do, I keep, I have a file with what's called the room tone, which is just, there's nothing. And it's a slight, there's a slight something. It's like the difference between when you're on the phone and no one's talking. And then when it actually disconnects and you're like, oh, that's real silence. And so if you, you don't want to just go from, from me talking to complete silence, cause it'll feel weird to the listener. Mm-hmm. And so I have room tone. So my first pass edit, I call it a visual edit because I do, I don't listen to it. I just notice um, mouth noises, which is like kind of noises. Like when you go to open your mouth, it makes this little tick. Mm-hmm. And I will just, I'll have a little cut of the room noise and I'll just control V. I'll highlight the, the tick and I'll put a control V. And I'll get rid of a lot of breaths, especially like the, <gasps> hey guys, you get that big like, you know, like someone's breathing in your ear, some breaths are okay. And this is where you get into like, I I would say that another thing you have to do is you have to listen to audiobooks. So if you're thinking of doing your own audiobooks, you need to under, you need to listen to audiobooks. You need to know what you like and what you don't like. Um, Are you going for a full one person play with huge voices and, and um, sobbing and all that? Or are you going for what I normally kind of prefer, which is like um, someone is reading me a book. Um, I I listen to a lot of David Sedaris and he does humorous nonfiction or narrative nonfiction. And he doesn't do crazy voices for everyone. He's telling you a story of what happened to him. And that's how I think of my, the minor first person POV books. And I think of it as like, I'm the character and I'm telling you the story and I do some voices. um, And that, you know, it's totally fair if people listen to my audiobooks and they go, I do not like the choices she made. Um, I totally respect that. And you can then, then do it differently. I highly recommend doing it differently. But if you don't listen to audiobooks, um, I hear people with crazy things where they're like, I want to have seven people and I want to have every voice be a different person and I want to have music behind the whole thing. And I go, well, that's not an audiobook. That's a <laughs> that's a radio play, which yeah. is fine. But want, I've listened to a lot of audiobooks and I don't want to listen to that. To me, that would be so 
Um, there's some romance writers that are doing it, and more power to them because they're being really successful. Maybe I should reconsider. But I, that's just too much input for me as an audio listener. I don't, all those voices seem very confusing to me. So, yeah, I like yeah. one, two, two narrators, and that's it. Yeah. And I have, I have strong feelings about a woman doing a man's voice, like really, like not pitching lower and being like, hey, it's good to see you, he said. But like where he's like, hey, it's yeah. good to see you. Like, okay, we're not on the production of Shrek. Like, we need to, like, bring it back a little bit. That's just a personal choice. But if you listen to a lot of audiobooks, then you know that not every, not every narrator makes those particular choices. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot to think about because I did my uh, nonfiction book. And, you know, nonfiction is just more straightforward. So, mm-hmm. you know, I didn't have to do as much as if I was doing fiction. But, um, yeah, you do have to figure out if you're going for the more conversational or the more formal, Mm -hmm. and then, you know, you have to decide how much of a performance you're going to do on top of learning all the technical stuff. So Mm -hmm. it's a process, but I enjoyed it. I thought it was fun. And Nikki helped me get started. She gave me some tips and I ended up deciding to outsource the editing, but you can certainly do that yourself. I would say, would you say that the editing is maybe a little bit easier than the performance as far as like if you, I, later on I thought mm, maybe I should have learned to edit it myself <laughs> right um I would say I found I enjoyed it so I don't know that everyone would I actually found that given unlimited time I would edit that thing down perfect because um I I have really strong feelings about how people speak so I would like listen and I'd be like that pauses a you know just a eighth of a second too long and so I would do it and I actually have had to like pull back I'd want to remove every breath I'd want to remove every mouth sound I'd want to um just I just over I won't say overproduce because I don't think I was making it worse so much as like people are listening to this at two times speed you know what I mean? Like mm-hmm. realistically most audio mm-hmm. as an audiobook yeah. listener most people are not listening at one time speed they're listening and they're not listening in a perfectly silent room. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not saying be lazy. I'm just saying um, if you are going through and your first listen is perfect, then maybe you should be a little bit pickier. If you're like me and you're finding that. Um, so I, I said I did the first visual. I did the, uh, the, did the visual edit. So I removed um, like spaces that are five five, six seconds long, where clearly I was like reading it and I was trying to figure out the exact right intonation. So I get those down. I already start with a scene break for me is 2.2 seconds. Um, Some people are 2.5, three. You just need to make sure you know ahead of time what you want it to be um, so that you can just go, oh, it's a scene break. Okay, 2.5 you know, 2.2 seconds or something like that, that that'll, that'll give the listener enough time to realize, oh, this is a big shift. Um, ACX will tell you how many seconds to put at the front and the back. Always pick the middle because I I used to do it right at one. It was a half a second to a second and I did it at one second. And that's the only time I've had files kicked back to me was because my threshold for a second and their threshold was slightly different. And so it didn't pass their qualification. So if they say one to five seconds, I pick three seconds and that, that way I have a little barrier. But, um, and then that first pass, I also remove all the claps, mm-hmm. um, and get everything done. And then I listen to it. And the theory is at that point, it should be clean. And occasionally I forget to clap. Sometimes um, stuff will be there. I listen with my book in front of me because occasionally my last book, I said a character's name was Cheat. And sometimes I said Chet. And I had a character that was named Min. And I had a character named Minx. And sometimes I would say one or the other. So I, I do that. Um, and then that's where I go. Oh, this this pause is is like I'm waiting for them to say the next line. I you know I'm waiting for me to say the next line. This is way too long, or I got really excited and the spaces were too tight, and so I'd add a little room noise. So that's my second one, um, my second listen through, and then I make my husband, of course, listen. I do the whole thing. I clean it up for the final version. Um, I keep my raw version, which is when I record it in. I keep my edited version. And then I run my final filters and I keep my final version because if you ever go and do pickups, you need to go back and do it 
pre filters because um, that is a, that is a huge thing because once you have the final version, you it won't match because the filters are run across the whole chapter. And so if you try to add it back in, it's going to be awkward. And I've had friends who have professional narrators and they don't do that because it's an extra step. It's an extra line. Um, I, because I have to clean audio, I only need to run the set RMS, which you can, you can Google, which equalizes the root mean squared, which I believe just brings everything to the same level. And then the limiter, which tops it off. And if your audio is good, your floor noise will be fine. And then you're, you're all, you can run ACX check. It'll tell you when it's done. I convert it to MP3 and I have my husband listen. And then he writes down, I, I do not bother fixing things like she entered suddenly and I read she suddenly entered. I, I don't bother with those fixes, but you have to fix the stuff like, um, you know, you say the wrong name. You've got to fix it, especially for a mystery. It's like you have to, <laughs> you can't be mixing up who found the dead body and stuff like that. Um, and then I go and it's a clue. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like huge. Like I had it where um, she meant to say when I found the body and she said when they found the body. And I was like, oh, it's such a huge hassle to like carry my computer back in here, <laughs> re-record that, redo everything. But I'm like, oh, I can't leave that because that, that, that changes the whole story. Um, and I know you asked me a question and I can't remember what, <laughs> what the question was. So I'm sorry if oh, I didn't no, answer I it. No, no, you answered it. Did great. Now we want to know how you promote your audio books. That's that is a great question. Oh, no. <laughs> I, would, I would love the answer to that. So yeah. right right now with this series, because this was sort of a test series and it's been a two year project. So whether or not it was the best idea to, t- I mean, it's so hard because we were I have a toddler and he is patient zero for everything, and so I was sick. Mm-hmm. And you cannot record with even like a slight sniffle because every sniffle has to be removed. Every, you know, everything has to be, has to be cleaned up. If my voice is even an octave lower, it, it's jarring when you do it. So um, I got a little bit off. And then, like I said, I'm a one person thing. So I wanted to, I just wanted to do, you know, one thing at a time. Um, I am I, I am with Find a Way, which I think is probably the best thing I can do for it for my audiobooks. Um, it releases to ACX. This particular one of the big reasons I would not consider audiobooks or even recording my own until I had Find a Way because ACX controls your pricing. And I think charging eight ninety nine for a three hour audiobook that I recorded myself is criminal. I do not feel comfortable with that. I just I just couldn't. Yeah. So when I so when I started doing audiobooks was two things. One, my friend suggesting it and the fact that find a way was, was kind of a new thing. Let's me get into libraries, which I'm super passionate about because that's how I listen to my audiobooks 99 times out of a hundred. Uh, I'm passionate about the library system as a public institute that makes education and entertainment free to community members. So that was a big, if that's the only people that ever listen to my books, I consider that a win because my cost is so low. My equipment's $150. Um, Audacity is free. Um, and my covers are $35 uh, in my case for me just to go back to my, my yeah. book cover and say, hey, can you just make it an audiobook? She charges me $35. Um, even, so even cheaper if you do your own covers. Um, and so going through Find A Way allows me to price the way I want. I still can't control it on, on, on Amazon, so I don't even – really mention to people that it's there, but I did get um, Author Direct, which is the storefront that you can buy through Findaway. They take a reasonable, whatever percentage it is, I felt it was totally fair. Um, there was a one-time setup fee and I can actually offer my books for free. So um, I sent Sarah a link. So if people are, this is always what I do. I hear advice from people. I'm like, I'm going to go check out their stuff. I'm not going to just take their word that this is good enough. I'm going to go listen to their book. You can, the first book is free, um, Death on the Range. You can check it out and you can decide, is this someone I want to listen to? Um, and what I would like to see as more and more people are moving to find a way and getting their own thing would be to do just what we did with eBooks, which is to put together a bunch of people who have a series with first free and series or 99 cents. And I'd like to do, um, and once I get my new series kind of up and going, I'll probably start recruiting people to do that, to just do a big blast and be like, hey, if you're an audiobook person, 
you can come and you can get our first and series free through the, the author direct app is super easy. It's what find a way uses to give away our copies. So if you get our copies, you can, um, that's the app that they downloaded on. I, I like it. I listen to stuff on it. Um, and so I am not doing that currently, but I think that's exactly how it'll work. It's just the same way eBooks do, which is you convince people to try out it, um, to try out a, um, an app, get people over to the app and then give them a free sample. And then they go, I can buy directly from the author. They get a better percentage and the author has a hundred percent control over the pricing. Sign me up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. That's a great. Uh, yeah. It's a great tool. Um, yeah. new kind of tool thing for, for authors. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. So, Oh, go ahead, Sarah. Well, I was just gonna say, I have an author's direct store as well. And the only thing I've seen, the only problem I've seen is that people who, if they're already signed up with ACX, they're, they would rather just wait and save their credit and mm. use their ACX credit. Yeah. So I think it is going to be, can you convince people to come over and try something? And probably a free book is the way to do it. Oh, yeah. Um, I think that's the best. Yeah. I think that's great. I mean, I, I'm the same way. I'm an audiobook listener, and I've been getting the chirp emails for six months, and I still have not signed up. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I know that the hardest part, and which is why I think if you got like 50 authors together, for 50 mm-hmm. authors all at once for a free ebook, I would sign up. And mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm, I'm a very typical consumer in the sense that if something's popular, I'm usually into it. I watch all the popular shows. I do all the popular stuff. Um, I mean, I'm not personally not popular, but I'm just that very typical <laughs> consumer. And I know that getting people to move over to a new app and entering in their credit card information and remembering to look there for books and stuff is going to be a big hurdle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. I think it's a great idea, though. Mm-hmm. You too. Me too. So what would you say is the one thing you've done to set yourself up for success, Nikki? Hmm. Gosh, that is a great question. Um, I've been really careful about who I listen to. Mm. Um, that is something that I consider to be a skill that you – is so, so valuable to self-publishing. And I still get caught all the time with um, catching myself doing things like, I don't understand. How are they making all this money? And then you find out they're not. They're spending 95000 to make 100000 They're not a six-figure author. They're a, they're a $5,000 author. Um, and that's why nothing was adding up. Um, or people who... Um, uh, lucked into stuff and luck does exist in this industry. And I'm not saying that everyone who's successful is lucky at all, but what I'm saying is there are people who did everything wrong mm-hmm. and it still worked for them. Maybe they're just that phenomenal of an author, but figuring out like, here's the advice that's going to work for me. Here's the advice that is going to work the most often. Here's who is what is their point of view? Are they trying to sell me a course? Which, you know, there's plenty of people selling courses who are full of it. And there's plenty of people who are selling courses who are legit. And so figuring out, but like, I can't, I wish I could give someone like, here's the formula. Here's who you listen to. And here you just, you just take their books times their review minus their this plus their this. And I can give you an (laughs) equation. And we know it's not like that. And it's going to vary too, because I was going to say, but then oh, you'd be rich <laughs> if you could, if you had the equation. Oh my gosh. Then I could just sell my formula. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that would be great. No, you I know, and then also true. just, it's, it's even, it's even who writes like you. So um, there are two authors in my genre who are both incredibly successful women. They both make a ton of money, um, but they have very, one of them is an incredibly fast writer. Her books are um, fun romps, but they are not intricate, you know, d- detail, lots of threads that come together and loop together. And the other author is a slower author, but that those are her books and they're intricate and stuff. And so, um, and they are both equally great writers. So I, this is not a judgment call, but I have to look and say, who am I more like? Am I someone who can turn out this many books in a year? Or mm-hmm. is, is it better for me to try to emulate this other woman who? I would I would be honored to say that I work like her in the sense that I, I have to write slower. It's going to probably be a little bit of a slower build, um, you know, all these kind of things. And so it's even even when 
you have 10 people who are all brilliant, honest, um, you know, people who are really genuinely trying to help you, you still can't listen to all of them. You still have to figure out who has a writing personality like me, who has an approach like me, who is, you know, that kind of thing. And so and that, that is really hard and it is totally fine if you respect someone and you still go, I don't think this advice is for me. Yeah. Right. That's really, I think that's super important. I think that's yes. super important because there's advice coming at us from everywhere. And especially when Sarah and I, she was doing it before me, but we sort of were listening to the same people and doing the same thing. And there was so much advice. It felt like, um, now we curate it a little bit better, but still there's a ton of advice. Yeah. I think it's and so much of it is con- contradict. Like one person will contradict another person. I mean, you know, and it's, so it's, it really is kind of like you have to know who you want to emulate, whose writing style is the best, same as yours, whose, whose voice is the same, you know, close to yours and stuff like that. I mean, that's right. Good. Right. There's a lot of good books that are really different. There's a lot of good books that are fast, instinctive feeling. They have a lot of energy, but there's not, I don't want to say anything that sounds negative yeah, but yeah. in the sense of like, styles. but you know, it's like, it's different styles and it's not just funny. So I can't just look at a, a funny writer because there's different kinds of funny and there's different kinds of romantic and sexy. And, um, and, and like, I always hear people say like, Oh, well you can't try too hard with funny. You think Jerry Seinfeld is over there just going on stage with just the first thoughts on his head? No, he worked, <laughs> he worked really, really hard. Same with sexy. Yeah. You know, it's not just all like, oh, I'm sexy and I'm just going to write the first draft and it's going to be perfect. And, you know, it's, there's, there's just so much going on and there's, it's, it's, it's like asking someone, well, how does your marriage work? Yeah. And we all instinctively know these are all different people. Like yeah. it, it, I cannot just copy a successful marriage. Um, and have my husband and I be like, this is exactly how we're going to do things. You know, mm-hmm. it's like, that's, that would, we know that wouldn't fly, but then with books and authors, we think, oh, well, if this person's successful, I have to do it their way. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good note to end on that. We have to keep, we have to sort of pull everything together, figure out what works for us, be wise in where we choose our advice yeah. and, mm-hmm. you know, make it our, like, make it our own and use mm-hmm. it our own way. So mm-hmm. That's really good advice. Well, thank yeah. you so much for sharing thank all of you. your tips and everything. Oh my gosh, it's been so great. Yeah. yeah. I think uh, I think Jamie should definitely narrate her own books now. Yeah. yeah. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not that, <laughs> the problem is I'm not that detail oriented. I mean, I'm just like, and I would get caught up in this is how you should do it. But anyway, yeah. I, I would only be able to narrate my books because I cannot do any accents other than the one I have. Like I, I have, I accent. What a lesson to learn. Yeah. (laughs) I I have a whole book that I, I made up a a Russian called Bordistan. So it's supposed to kind of like be a Kazakhstan. (laughs) So they have this Russian accent and I'm like, Oh I my gosh, what have I done to myself? <laughs> it's, it sounded pretty rough. Yeah. So I'm like, maybe maybe this wasn't the right choice, but no silly accents from here on out. Yeah, well, so the funny. thing is, like, talk, talk about listening to your own voice. I'm fine listening to my own voice, but I took an acting class back before the pandemic. I was in it, and I, one of the scenes was from Goodfellas, and he wanted me to mm. do the New Jersey accent, and I was like, listen, I'm just going to tell you right now, that's not going to happen. I mean, like, let me just do it my way. So I did it. It was great. Actually, he said it was probably the best thing I've done, but then we came back the next week, and we were supposed to do it even better, and he said he wanted to hear a New Jersey accent. Y'all, it was so bad, and, and it was just like it hurt my ears to even <laughs> listen to it. So, so I, I I can't I can't I can only do my voice and my accent and I can clean it up and not be so country but not much so it would just have to be my book love it <laughs> well you'd be perfect it would be yeah. perfect so Nikki tell everybody where they can find out more about you and your books um nikki haverstock.com has all my books all my information mm-hmm. you can also search nikki haverstock on virtually any social media. I do have a YouTube channel. If you search for Nikki Haverstock, it's, it's um, an author tube channel, which just basically means I talk about writing stuff Mm -hmm. and updates and all that. I also, this is 
uh, I started the channel because my husband and I recap reality shows. So if you are passionate about Sister Wives or RuPaul's Drag Race, you can also find <laughs> me there, and we can discuss we can discuss those. But um, I will say, if you're even considering it, you know, a YouTube channel is a good a good way to kind of practice and see. Like, oh, I wonder if this is something, maybe performing's a little bit for me. But yeah, you can f- kind of find me everywhere. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, all that. All right. Well, we will have well, thank all you those. so notes. much for being here. Yeah. We loved great. it. Oh, thank you. All right. All right. So you can find all the links and everything at um, wishadknownforwriters.com. So thanks for listening and we'll see you next week. All right. Bye. Thanks for listening to the Wish I'd Known Then podcast. We hope this episode inspired you, empowered you, and made you laugh a little bit too. If you loved it, tell your friends about it. And if you feel so inclined, leave us a review. We look forward to being with you again next week.